Hi, Ray. How are you doing? Hi, very well. Great. Well, I, I'm, I'm just, I feel just thrilled to, to be speaking with you today. I, I, I'm, I'm, I love that you uh, express interest in this topic of education. I'm really excited about this. I, I, I think uh, it'll be a great one. The topic is education. In other words, how can we grow a rich, dynamic, uh, and, and, and just a quality education in the year 2020 and beyond. What does this look like? How can it be cultivated? Uh, I think I think you're a great person to talk to when it comes to this. Uh, w would you mind, I, I think, for, for our listeners, uh, who, the people who might listen to this and enjoy this, w would you mind going into your background? Why, why are you such a good person um, to listen to when it comes to education? Oh, I, I actually started thinking uh, about education uh, when I was about eight years old. Uh, we moved to Oregon uh, from San Diego, and uh, uh, I, I had a couple of years uh, at a very tiny school. I think there were a, a dozen students in eighth grades, and so as a, a third grader, I, I got to listen to the lessons for all of the grades uh, and uh, uh, the, the um, uh, when I uh, got to got to uh, uh, the junior high uh, I realized I had already heard the, the lessons for a couple of years previously uh, and uh, I we we had a, a little uh, encyclopedia uh, published about 1930, and it had an article about uh, uh, experimental schools, uh, and I heard about Bertrand Russell's uh, 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 the private school he started, uh, and his wife, uh, and uh, that, that uh, really got me thinking uh, uh, how, how good the experience was in that uh, tiny country school. And then uh, when I got to the, the city schools, uh, how, how uh, regimented and deadening it was. Uh, so uh, all the way through high school, uh, I, I experienced that stifling effect of, of most of the classes. Uh, uh, for example, the uh, biology teacher, 10th uh, grade biology, uh, didn't refused to talk about evolution. Wow. Um, uh, uh, most of the teachers uh, were similarly uh, backward. Uh, there were two or three uh, very good people, uh, and I realized that uh, getting to know enlightened people was the thing, not taking their courses. Uh, uh. And uh, when, I, when I went to college, a little state college, I, I sampled all of the required courses, uh, and similarly, uh, most of them were taught by people who uh, basically just uh, uh, surveyed what was in the textbook. <laughs> Some of them literally wrote uh, everything out on the blackboard laboriously. <laughs> wow. And uh, there, uh, I... I had a, a couple of uh, good introductory science courses that uh, the people uh, actually uh, uh, took took teaching seriously uh, and uh, wanted to get the, the main ideas across. But uh, accidentally, I, I heard about a, a literature professor who had a reputation for being a, a hard grader, but uh, the literature uh, instructor uh, I had first uh, was just impossibly uh, tedious, and so I, I, I switched over to the one with the reputation of being a hard grader and found that he was actually just talking to his students and explaining how he saw each of the periods of literature uh, and uh, revealing that he had a, a big picture of what's going on in the world and that each uh, phase of literature uh, was a way of seeing the world from 
different perspectives. Uh, so uh, I had the expectation that graduate school uh, might have uh, other people like that uh, and found that uh, they were even scarcer in graduate school uh, than in a little state college. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I, first I, I got a, a general studies master's degree in which I was able to <clears throat> uh, pick out professors that I thought were sane uh, and then do a one-to-one uh, -one reading and conference uh, sort of tutorial with them uh, and uh, uh, went on to uh, uh, specialize in linguistics and, and found a couple of professors uh, with, for, for similar one-to-one -one tutorials. Uh, but that, that was in 1959 and 60. Uh, the master's was 56, 57. Uh, and at that time, uh, the, the best of the professors uh, had to be extremely cautious. Uh, the, the, um, the, uh, for, for example, the, the atmospheric bomb tests were going on. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, if anyone criticized militarism or the dangers of dumping radioactive fallout onto populations, uh, they were uh, fired from their, their government jobs and uh, cut off from all sorts of communication. Uh, if uh, a professor signed a petition opposing war or bomb testing, uh, they lost their tenure uh, and or got fired. Uh, wow. the, the atmosphere uh, was uh, uh, probably just about uh, as bad as the 1930s under Hitler, but uh, no one really uh, talked about it in the U.S. because it was defined as how democracy works. Jeez. So it sounds like, uh, you know, like it's not just that, that these teachers, so many of your teachers, so many of the teachers that we probably have all had, were, were just doing their job and doing what they had learned to do, collecting a paycheck, but it was that also that they were afraid in some ways. To, it took a lot of guts to, to teach differently, perhaps. Um, uh, yeah, in one of my literature seminars, uh, the the – uh, issue of, uh, you, know, you know, lots of the uh, famous 18th century literary figures were members of the ruling class. Uh, and uh, I, I mentioned something about uh, the, the present uh, uh, effect of class on literature and viewpoints. And the, the professor interrupted me and said there are no classes in the United States. Oh, unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. So, so, so no one was encouraged then to think for themselves. How did anyone make it out thinking differently? Uh, um, I, I got a job uh, teaching college that year uh, and uh, was assigned to teach uh, uh, introduction to Physics for Biology Majors uh, as one of my courses. And uh, uh, the president of the college uh, said what he wanted was for the students to be able to understand what they read in the newspapers uh, as well as uh, have the information they, they should know as a biology freshman. And since the issues in the newspapers uh, related to uh, a, a, a lot of uh, discussion of uh, atom bombs and, and nu nuclear energy mm -hmm. and quite a bit of discussion about uh, computers, I, I decided to, that those would be good themes uh, to talk about. And uh, uh, so I, I discussed how energy uh, what, what energy means to an organism uh, and what uh, ionizing 
radiation does to a cell. And uh, it happened that in the spring term, uh, a visitor from uh, University of Illinois came to give a lecture. Uh, he, he was invited with, without assigning a topic. And when he got there, uh, he lectured on the biological effects of uh, radioactive isotopes, just what I had been talking to my students about. Uh -huh. And uh, he was, uh, uh, that week he was fired from his job at the University of Illinois uh, uh, with, without mentioning his anti-war, anti-bomb test uh, position, but uh, accusing him of, of uh, supporting uh, sexual freedom uh, among college students. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the effect of his uh, lecture uh, on radiation uh, was disturbing uh, to the administrators at my college. And it, uh, it ended up with me uh, getting fired. And uh, that immediately led me to uh, think about the general issue of, of college education, mm -hmm. uh, uh, modeling it, for example, on uh, Bertrand Russell's school uh, and the other experimental schools I had read about in the early part of the century. Uh, so so uh, I decided to start my own college. <laughs> and uh, the professor from Illinois uh, was going on a lecture tour about uh, academic freedom, and he was he was in the news uh, for suing the University of Illinois. And in his lectures, he, he mentioned that we were starting a, a college uh, that would be free from intervention by by trustees. Yeah. Uh, and so we gathered up some students, and uh, I found that. The boards of education in the United States wouldn't let you give a, a transcript if you didn't have a certain amount of money behind you. Uh, but if you had uh, uh, an endowment of some sort, uh, buildings or property, then you could, in effect, sell your degrees and transcripts. It was legal to have a, a degree mill, but not to uh, give even a, a letter saying that the student had been there if you didn't have uh, money that you had at risk. Uh, so that if you said the wrong thing, uh, the state could shut you down and take your money. My gosh, so just like all these other institutions, it's just been a business. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I went to, that was in California, and I went to um, Oregon thinking they might uh, have a different attitude. Uh, the assistant secretary of, of uh, education or public instruction uh, ended our conversation saying it doesn't matter. Uh, education isn't about what students know. I, 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 I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm not surprised because I've been I've been reading a, a lot of uh, you know various uh, viewpoints and listening to some of the things you said and and uh, it, but but it it hurt, it, it really uh, troubles me. I mean, it's it's deeply uh, disconcerting. Uh, just back back to uh, Blake College and and you said Bertrand Russell uh, was an early influence of yours, and, and, and you talked about the, the experimental school that he and his wife had built. Um, what, what were some of the educational practices or some of the educational philosophy that they had going that worked their work its way into what you did with Blake College? Uh, just to recognize that each student was an individual, uh, uh, pretty much the, the same thing that A.S. Neal did at Somerville, uh -huh. uh, just to... Uh, recognize that everyone is is in the world wanting to understand it and uh, 
they dealt with that. Uh, whatever the individual uh, wanted to know and needed to know. What did you do at uh, at Blake um, with with students that allowed them to get to know themselves better and to get to form opinions without uh, without uh, you know outside influence? Uh, uh, for example, uh, we would have uh, at one point we had an old hotel uh, and. Uh, several instructors and students had had rooms in the same building, uh, and uh, so a, a professor could say, uh, "At home, I, I teach courses in so and so." Yeah. And uh, uh, the students, if they thought that was interesting, uh, one of them would say, "Well, uh, we'd like to hear you talk about that," and so. Uh, all of the other students who were interested would would get together uh, and m spend uh, maybe five or six hours continuously uh, in conversation. And typically, uh, they would cover uh, uh, at least a, a semester's uh, coursework at home uh, in one sitting. Wow. So that, that I mean, it, it really just sounds so good to me that, that someone gets to decide what they want to do, that everything's optional. And then if they wanted to, like, for example, like pass uh, national exams that showed they were ready for grad school or whatever, that, that this was something they could they could do also, right? Um, yeah. Um, they, they took the graduate record exam general studies. Uh, uh, I, I forget the oh, – oh, they were called area tests. Uh, they had uh, the departmental tests, uh, history, math, biology, and so on, but they had the area tests that were given at that time to graduating seniors across the U.S. And so uh, if you scored 50th percentile on, an, on the three area tests, uh, that was uh, typical of, of a graduate of a four-year college in the U.S. Uh, it was humanities, uh, general, uh, uh, social studies, and science were the three areas. Okay. Uh, and uh, our, our, we just set arbitrarily the idea that we wanted the students to uh, have, have the experience of what it was to be there and so we said uh, you had to be here six months, uh, two quarters uh, participating, and then uh, you could take the test. And they averaged, <laughs> after uh, only six months, uh, the students who took the tests, uh, I think their average was 92nd percentile. Wow. Ray, I love how you're talking about the relationship aspect and the one-to-one -one opportunity, and just that you, you mentioned earlier that like if you wanted to, if you want to learn, then it's the relationship. It's not the classes. It's not the the things that you're studying. It's the relationships. It's interpersonal uh, communication and being with people. Um, do you think that the people who attended Blake College were generally uh, feeling the same way? Did they love? Did they love this? Were they happy? Um, uh, one guy uh, uh, said that he uh, was considered uh, sort of retarded. He had scored something like the fourth percentile uh, on some test that he had taken in high school. Uh, and uh, he was only there for 10 weeks, but uh, we let him uh, t take the, the test just because uh, he he w was a, a special uh, problem that, that, mm -hmm. that be believed he was uh, n not up to uh, the, the standard. But after just uh, ten weeks, he scored at the 50th percentile ranking with equal of the average United States college graduate. Huh. Uh, so so what was it that he was? Accepted and allowed to to find his personhood and explore. I mean, is that is that 
got to be a part of this, right? Like the, the, the confidence that goes with being able to do what you want grows. Uh, yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, one one of our uh, uh, people was uh, he had been a TV whiz kid on, on one of the TV shows where he was a straight A student, and uh, so they they had a panel of of supposedly very uh, bright, well educated uh, kids, but uh, he he said he. I didn't know how to think, and what he wanted to do was uh, just uh, uh, put himself together so that he could think with his knowledge, because he said it was completely useless to him. That's 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 awesome that that you were giving opportunities to people like that who maybe were were labeled as smart, right? Like labeled as people who. They, they they receive the information out of a book well and they and they could you know spit it out they could regurgitate you know information but that had nothing to do with thinking and it's it's cool that even the individual recognized the importance of that. I if one of the things you said reminded me of A. S. Neal he said once that uh, a good teacher does not draw out he gives out and what he gives out is love and by love I mean approval or if you like friendliness good nature. The good teacher not only understands the child, he approves of the child. Um, do, do you care to add anything to that? Uh, uh, yeah. Do you know Carl Rogers and his client-centered therapy? I've read a, I've read a little bit of his stuff now. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. That that was one of my uh, 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 for, 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 while I was a, a, a psychology major in graduate school for a while. Uh, I, I had a professor that. Uh, introduced me to people like Carl Rogers, uh, and uh, his thing was unconditional positive regard uh, was therapeutic uh, in the, the the treatment situation, but it, it's also educational. It's essential for for uh, learning and, and teaching just as much as for psychotherapy. I love that. You know, it, it reminded me of, and I don't know how um, familiar you are with Nietzsche or what you think of Nietzsche, but his, he, he, he um, apparently, from my understanding, there's this thing called amor fati or amor fati, and he, he um, I, I, one of his translations, I, I saw that he said, my formula for greatness in a human being is amor fati, uh, that one wants nothing to be different, not forward, not backward, not in all eternity not merely bearing what is necessary uh, and still less concealing it, but rather loving it. Uh, and I don't know, that, 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 to me that speaks a little bit to like that, that in order to, to, to change something or to see, to, to see challenges and come up with new solutions, you kind of got to start where you are. And um, I don't know, do you, do you have anything to add to that? I, I, yeah, you know uh, John Dewey's famous phrase that, Education isn't preparation for life; it is life itself. Oh, I like that. I, uh, I like that. The, the uh, uh, another uh, philosopher, psychologist that uh, I think was uh, very insightful and useful was Eric Schachtel, who wrote the, the book *Metamorphosis*. Uh, and in that, he uh, has the ideas of allocentric perception uh, starting in infancy uh, in which you learn to see uh, empathy basically to, to see that there are other beings and to uh, learn to let your uh, involvement go out and have them participate uh, in, in a personal way uh, but that uh, the uh, the way things are set up, uh, people uh, start uh, what he called uh, secondary uh, autocentric perception mm -hmm. uh, in, in which uh, things are understood and valued only uh, as they are useful uh, in your little self-contained world. You, you don't go out of yourself. You bring everything useful in to your control. Hmm. Why, why do you think it is that, that, that we learn to do that? Um, the, the 
attitude towards language uh, of the parents and the schools, uh, it usually gets built in uh, by uh, the time a kid starts school uh, with the parents uh, telling them what to believe, basically. Uh, uh, not not uh, uh, introducing them to the, the richness and possibilities of each thing, uh, each thing uh, as a, a complexity uh, that remains to be understood, but uh, giving finished answers uh, and uh, uh, give, giving them a world ready to use uh, but uh, not to uh, get too involved in personally. Oh, I like that. Uh, A.S. Neal, in, in his writing on Summerhill, I, I, he did write something about that. He, he also wrote something about that where he talked about how rare it was for him to – in fact, he, he didn't even know if his own children were able to be self-regulated and, and develop a, a kind of their own way of looking at things. It just It was such a challenge for him. Um, I, yeah, the, the, the teacher uh, r really uh, uh, can't do anything more than uh, be enthusiastic about uh, living and discovering, uh, and uh, that can't avoid being communicated if, if the teacher is really uh, living his life that way. I like that. What, what else do you think a teacher should be in, in the most valuable sense? Like, what, what is a teacher? What, what can a teacher's role be? Uh, oh, um, uh, everyone uh, uh, has accumulated uh, lots of experiences, uh, and uh, so uh, being uh, sharing your perspective on your experiences. Uh, expands uh, when when someone is really listening to you. Uh, everything you say is flavored by uh, your experiences, uh, and so when you expand uh, on describing your per experiences and perspectives, uh, you're uh, intelligible uh, to the person who is uh, seeing them as part of your personality. Uh, you aren't saying, here is this uh, uh, definitely known uh, bit of stuff that, that you should stuff into uh, your memory, yeah. but, but here is uh, uh, the uh, pattern of, of uh, problems uh, that, uh, that I experienced uh, and uh, just, just in uh, using language, you're always uh, ultimately uh, asking your listener to uh, invent uh, what what I'm saying. Yeah, you, you have to share your your minds, uh, and uh, I'll invent it while I'm saying it. If, if you will invent it uh, along with me. Yeah, I like that. And then when I go share my version of what we talked about, it's going to be another creation. Yeah. Right? Uh, and uh, Alfred North Whitehead uh, put, made that very explicit uh, when he said, uh, "No, no sentence is complete and explicit in itself. Uh, it always implies everything." Oh, I think that's great. Is that part of what I think he had his, his fundamental stages of learning: romance, precision, and generalization? Is that part of the generalization? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is most personal is also most general and universal. Uh, if you really uh, are involved in something and uh, share uh, that, that involvement, it involves the, the whole uh, world as you understand it. So personal and, and universal can't be separated. Wow. I did, didn't um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, in his essay on self-reliance, speak to that, saying something like that whatever is, is felt by me is true for everyone? I, I think he expressed it differently, but is that kind of what he was getting at? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Emerson was very good. 
Um, I, I heard my one of my buddies uh, is philosophy PhD, and he um, he learned uh, he he became fluent in German so he could study Hegel and Nietzsche. And one of the stories he told me about Nietzsche was that he carried around a, a book bag with him a lot uh, wherever he went, and the, it had books his favorite books. And he I guess um, my buddy was telling me that he abhorred American writers with the exception of Emerson. He carried around um, essays of Emerson's. He loved reading Emerson. It always made him happy and, and, and helped, helped, his, helped his thinking, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Emerson was really much more radical than people think. Um, one, of, one of the things you said earlier, Ray, I thought was interesting about the, um, you know, everyone, everyone's, you know, literature or, or literature from different periods gives us an, a window into that, into that time period. And then you you said later about you know when you sh when we share stories when we talk about what what we're excited about that that might be a window for someone else in, into some new world and and I, it got me thinking about Tolstoy for some reason because I I remember reading somewhere that, that Tolstoy started an experimental school and mm -hmm. he apparently um, he taught um, he didn't teach writing like in any kind of traditional way he just wanted people to write and he wanted people's stories. To come out, and he wanted the content to come out, and he didn't grade or look at punctuation or grammar because he thought that eventually that would just correct itself. Um, uh, what he really wanted was the story, like the, what someone was trying to say, and just just write that. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that about Tolstoy, but uh, I uh, at, at Montana State uh, was given uh, two or three writing courses every term, and uh, the department had instructions on how to grade papers and how to flunk out. The, the policy, was, I think, was to fail 50% uh, of, of the first, uh, first term students. Uh, and uh, they had an absolute way to grade uh, spelling and common, commas, uh, semicolons, and so on. Okay. Uh, and uh, my uh, first a uh, few weeks, uh, my students were doing the standard 50% uh, absolute horrible uh, uh, grammar and punctuation, and they were they were writing idiotic stuff. And uh, after about five or six weeks, I, I told the classes that I just couldn't stand reading anymore of that. <laughs> That kind of, of drunk, and that from then on, I was going to ignore the mechanics and grade them to totally on whether they said something sensible that I could stand to read. <laughs> and immediately, uh, their language became fluid, and uh, they, they all, from that point on, uh, failed to fail. <laughs> Wow, it's almost like they were they wanted they were getting a chance to say what they really wanted to say finally. Uh, yeah, and that's how language works. It, 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 the form follows the meaning. Uh, and if you focus on the form, you destroy the meaning and the meaning that, that means that your form has no uh, nothing to hang on. So the form becomes uh, extremely bad. A deck of cards, so to speak, almost. It it reminds me of biology. Uh, uh, yeah, in 1968, uh, when, when students were uh, rebelling against uh, university formalism and such, uh, one of our biology professors uh, said, uh, "Students uh, are." They have to be uh, treated with with authority and, and firmness. Uh, they they want to uh, speak, learn to speak a language before they uh, learn the, the alphabet or, or uh, the, the rules. Uh, and she wanted to teach science uh, the same way she conceives that people learn language, but uh, in, in fact, uh, 
you, you learn the, the language before you learn the alphabet. Right. I, I, I remember reading also in one, in one of A.S. Neal's accounts of Summerhill about a boy who, who, didn't, who couldn't read, um, didn't want to read, had no interest in reading. Um, he was 16 years old, 17 years old. He still didn't want to read. Um, and then he um, decided he wanted to pass some, like, you know, basically um, state, you know, kind of uh, exam to, to kind of prove that he had done, you know, the high school equivalent or whatever. And he, he studied for a couple months, basically taught himself how to read, became a carpenter, I think ASL said, and, and, and had three wonderful boys and, and, and made a living the rest of his life and had, had his own, had his own uh, business and, and just did so, so well. Um, but it, it kind of made me think of that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I think that, that applies to everything. Uh, you, you learn the language before you learn uh, the, the alphabet and how to punctuate. Uh, uh, every uh, five or six year old has thousands of words uh, of vocabulary and uh, can, can use them uh, to communicate. Uh, when, when you uh, begin studying physics or uh, chemistry or, or biology, uh, you, you should start with uh, with the language and learn learn the punctuation later. It seems to me like when, when it becomes meaningful in some context that you need to know the punctuation or the grammar that it's that, like you're saying it, it, it's something you'll learn at that point, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, the, it, it only uh, has meaning in terms of meaning. Uh, you have to have the meaning there before uh, the mechanics has any reality. That makes sense. Ray, go, Ray going back to, to Blake College, um, at, at, at some point, you know, that the Blake College experience kind of ended for everyone. Um, was, can you talk about that a little bit and why that happened and, and, and you know, what were some, what were some uh, kind of extreme positives, even though it ended, you know, that came out of that? Uh, oh, um, the... the, the um, so, several people uh, went to good graduate school, and some became uh, painters. Uh, one became a playwright, uh, and uh, uh, they they all uh, uh, went went on uh, doing doing what they wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the reason it came to an end uh, was the uh, uh, the Vietnam War was going on. Uh, uh, first, we had a visit from the cultural attaché uh, that said he wanted to, to uh, just uh, learn what uh, Americans were doing with the school in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, but he asked me why why I wasn't, uh, if I was a, a linguist uh, a graduate student, why why I hadn't become involved with the Summer Linguistics Institute project. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and, and that was a CIA front uh, organization uh, uh, to uh, uh, train train the Indians uh, to uh, be obedient, basically. Uh, See. But, but when I told him I just wasn't interested in biblical translations, he <laughs> he put me down as some kind of kind of subversive. Uh, and then uh, a couple of years later, uh, a guy in an Army uniform, uh, which was illegal in Mexico at that time to wear a, a foreign uh, uniform. Yeah. Uh, he came way out to Valle de Bravo uh, and uh, introduced himself as the military attaché of the embassy and said he wanted to interview us. And uh, I don't know, I assume. He asked each of us similar questions, but he did it in, in private. Uh, spent half an hour in, in my bedroom uh, asking me uh, what my view of the war was, what his purpose was. Wow. And uh, I, I told him I thought its basic uh, motivation was, was economic. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, it was uh, several months after that that uh, a, a series of 
of events uh, that could only have been organized uh, by uh, some higher powers uh, took place uh, uh, in, in which they uh, organized uh, several levels, uh, including uh, newspaper reporters uh, and uh, Madeline Murray uh -huh. uh, and uh, a, a guy who had identified himself uh, as uh, from from Chicago. He had clippings showing that he was a, a, a janitor uh, posing as a communist for the FBI. And <laughs> in Valle de Bravo, he uh, ingratiated himself uh, as an expatriate American. And uh, my father got acquainted with him, uh, got him drunk several afternoons, uh, and <laughs> learned his story. Uh, he showed credentials uh, from both FBI, uh, Marine Corps retired, uh, and CIA. And uh, oh, yeah. I. That guy married Madeline Monroe, uh, uh, Madeline Murray, <laughs> and uh, uh, she had the project of becoming president of Blake College. Okay. And uh, she, uh, uh, the, the outcome basically was that uh, she fed. Uh, stories uh, to the uh, embassy and the uh, the local police and the newspapers uh, that the school was a front for Fidel Castro and for drug uh, production and smuggling. My gosh! So when Madeline Murray 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 got involved, like she, her, did, I mean, you thought her in, her. Um her uh, motivations were pretty benign, didn't you? And then, and then, uh, yeah. At first, she she said she was uh, 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 it, it started in Maryland. Uh, uh, she was accused of of uh, beating up uh, uh, two policemen, causing one to have a heart attack, uh, and uh, was wanted uh, for for assault, among other things and yeah. went went to Hawaii and uh, so uh, it, it looked like she had been uh, persecuted for her atheism uh, and uh, she claimed to be a, a lawyer and sociology professor uh, and uh, so she came to teach sociology uh, but uh, b even before she got there it came out that uh, her plan was to uh, have me removed and take over the school. Unbelievable. Uh, and so after she got there, she uh, married this uh, embassy uh, contact, Dick O'Hare. Okay. So this is before, this is after this happened after like her campaign against the schools in America, right? With the Pledge of Allegiance and getting got uh, out of the classroom and, and so on. Uh, so forth. Yeah. Yeah. All of that was prior. Wow. So and then so the government just really didn't want Amer um, American, right? Co College-bound American students to be going to Mexico to learn how to think for themselves. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, especially during the Vietnam War, in 1964 and five, uh, they didn't want uh, dissenters. Uh, uh, also, with the possibility of, of not being drafted so soon. Did you ever think about doing what you had done at Blake again at some point? Oh, oh yeah, repeatedly. Uh, 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 following that experience, uh, I had acquaintances in, in the government, uh, surveillance people who uh, one guy became a lifelong friend. Uh, and uh, year, years later, when his wife was drunk, uh, she let it out that he was his business was surveillance. See, uh, but, but uh, every time I would uh, get an idea of of going somewhere, uh, like to uh, uh, San uh, El Salvador or Nicaragua, yeah, he, he would warn me uh, that uh, it, it wasn't a good place for staying alive.
<laughs> so you so you felt you trusted him enough. He was a good enough friend that that he had the he had some inner knowledge of of how how they were watching various various situations and people and such. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, right after he warned me about not going to uh, Salvador, uh, a union guy I knew uh, was planning to go with a group of of union organizers from the Northwest. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, the the night before he went, uh, and I knew uh, from personal experience that he was phobic uh, for for marijuana. Uh, because he he didn't want uh, his union uh, activities stigmatized by uh, being associated, even staying in a room where someone was smoking marijuana. Wow. Uh, But the night before he was to leave to go to Salvador, uh, his apartment was raided and uh, marijuana was planted, and he was held in jail while the group... uh, flew to El Salvador, Uh, I think he was held only long enough to miss his flight. And the guys that got there were all murdered while sitting in the restaurant. Oh, my gosh. So he he had a a caretaker in the government. Wow. It it just seems to me like it's just one thing to the next, like what what is stigmatized in order to... Um, assert power uh, or control over a population it just seems kind of crazy. Uh, uh, yeah, th- th- there are here and there uh, the uh, the good people uh, in bad places uh, who can uh, modify the evil a little bit, uh, but basically the whole apparatus is set up uh, to, to be obedient to the the big purposes. Do you feel like, in some ways, that the the the, the, the winds of change, be it if they go into kind of a more free direction, is just like one little act at a time? I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But that's. Uh, I started getting discouraged uh, in the late 1960s, following the the Blake thing, uh, and uh, started seeing the that the U.S. was being treated as on a course to becoming just more of the third world, that the masses of the U.S. weren't on a course of democracy. And I think that is what we've been seeing progressively. And I think this current thing uh, of the the pandemic or the right. plan, pandemic, is, yeah, yeah, uh, I think it's a, a late stage of the process of of uh, uh, shaking down uh, small businesses, getting them out of the way, uh, uh, like uh, the Gates Foundation and the United Nations Agriculture Organization are uh, right right now in process in. Africa uh, of destroying uh, small subsistence uh, agriculture and replacing it with uh, giant industrial soybean farms. Uh, And uh, the same thing, uh, 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 the, uh, do you know the Corbett Report? Uh, I've heard of it. I haven't watched any of it. they have a good, a good episode on, uh, uh, it's called, uh, Was There Foreknowledge of the Pandemic? Uh, and it, it shows that the, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, was uh, doing drastic, historically novel uh, stuff uh, already in uh, September of last year uh, that l- looked like the, the beginning of what was only announced uh, several weeks ago as the uh, trillion, multi-trillion dollar uh, uh, bailout. Uh, They were starting on this multi-trillion dollar uh, uh, pre-bailout already in September. (laughs) And uh, an agency of the Defense Intelligence Agency 
according to an ABC News uh, item that was uh, multiply uh, confirmed, many sources confirmed it, uh, that this uh, medical intelligence branch reported that around the end of November, uh, a virus uh, uh, was uh, on, on the move in Wuhan. Uh, but, but China didn't uh, mention it uh, until uh, late December uh, and uh, didn't start taking action until, uh, uh, I think, 23rd of, of January. But our uh, Defense Intelligence Agency already reported it uh, before the Chinese knew about it. So disheartening. In, in, li in light of th that and everything that, that seems to be as corrupt and confusing and, and you know, just, just kind of bizarre as ever, do you think it makes sense for more and more people, for bringing it back to education, do you think it makes sense for more and more people to to, to be trying to do their own thing and, and, and to get out of that institutionalized kind of, uh, you know, scheme schematic, or do you think it's just a... a you know, uh, impossible almost to, get to to do our own thing. Uh, well, I, I think it limits. Uh, uh, you're not going to be able to organize uh, on the uh, internet anymore. Uh, but uh, organization uh, on a person-to-person -person basis, yeah, I, th I think is necessary. Uh, and the organization basically means communication. Uh, uh, the putting education processes into action, making mm -hmm. it live, and uh, that kind of reorganization since the, the, the system is basically being modified from the top down, shaking down all of the dissent by, by creating unemployment, making them dependent on whatever they can get together and, and on the way to becoming total serfs. The people who are sensing that something is wrong with the system that they have believed in, they're ripe for a new way of being. Uh, and I think education has to be at, at the, the foundation of that. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, uh, a, a fanatical kind of a fascism uh, would uh, be an alternative to, to the uh, well-organized uh, uh, sort of in, invisible fascism that is in process. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you say that about education. I think I, I feel that I feel that in my bones too. That that you know it kind of starts starts with education. Do we have to, in some ways, do you think like like almost wear a costume in some ways, like in certain places we go and like kind of act like we're we're, we're following the, the the rules, so to speak, and but be communicating, you know, kind of in those interpersonal relationships and um, uh, uh, you know the the outward form. It uh, doesn't matter if, if you're alive on the inside. Uh, uh, you can create new life forms uh, uh, fully uh, across the system, uh, and then uh, it will at some point uh, be unnecessary to, to maintain uh, the yeah. skies. Game in some ways, right? Like you can play that game in many different ways, which is like I don't know. In my mind, flexibility is a is a hallmark of intelligence. Mm -hmm. So if we can if we can be smart enough to you know kind of know what hat we have to wear in what room, and uh, and also have those you know those those meaningful conversations and those those uh, you know, that that time for thought you know behind closed doors. Um, I don't know, do, do, Ray. Do you do you ever feel like you're being watched? You know, on a minor way, like you know, with with some of the stuff that you've been working on over the years. Oh, oh I've, for for many years, I, I was I was sure of it with with uh, that guy who, whose wife said he worked in surveillance. Uh, no matter where I went, he would contact me. 
I, I would have neglected to stay in touch with him, uh, but uh, uh, he, he always knew what I was doing. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, he wasn't there when Blake College was was shut down, but he knew exactly uh, what had happened and where I had gone. Uh, I asked him how he knew, and he said, "Oh, he, he was in, uh, I think it was uh, uh, Switzerland, and he said he read it in in an international newspaper." Wow, I, I mean, so even even today, like like you know, you 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 seem so insightful to me, and you're you're giving such good um, information that's inspiring. I think, and and and, you, and you're helping reshape and rework how people feel about you know uh, biology and health, and 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 just just being able to think for for ourselves. And um, I mean, do you ever worry that that someone's gonna you know kind of shut it down or say you know enough is enough? Oh, 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 years ago I stopped doing personal consultations because. <laughs> Uh, the medical people were sending spies uh, r ridiculous people that didn't even know how to how to dress appropriately they, they looked like they were going to a doctor's office but <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> um, the the uh so the, there was a david ike do you know who david ike is oh, oh yeah David Ike did an interview with some guy um I can't remember Brian Rose I think is his name he has a a podcast called London Real in the UK, and, and he's been gaining popularity over the years. And I, and I yeah, he, I, I think I saw that very one on on the coronavirus. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I guess they 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 um all you know the people at YouTube, the people at LinkedIn, the people at Facebook, the people at you know all the major places where this could be listed, you know, or, or put on a platform. Uh, they they banned it. They took it down. They 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 completely you know basically obliterated this this video and part one and part two. And so I guess Brian Rose is he's going to put out a part three with David Ike that he's hoping you know more people than in the history of any you know internet thing watch it. But he had to build his own platform so that uh, it could be uh it could be shown. I think it was probably part one that I saw, but I watched the whole thing and I didn't see anything at all that he said. Uh, that I didn't agree with. Uh, he uh, has uh, uh, the ability to uh, be so far outside the system uh, that he doesn't swallow uh, any of the propaganda. That's cool. That's cool to know and hear your hear your thoughts on that. Um, I'm, I guess the uh, the part three is going to be in eight days or something. So I'm curious to see uh, how that goes and how long it stays on the internet. So, um, Ray, this this idea that learning is important to life. Okay, I want to bring it back here. I just think it's it's it, it, it's the kind of the whole reason we're doing this, and I want to come back to it. This the idea that learning is is an inherent desire, an inherent part of life, a part of evolution, a part of development, a heart part of like. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, where where does that come from? It doesn't have to be taught. Like, you don't have to force someone to learn, right? Where where does learning come from? Oh, oh uh, it, it's uh, something that uh, starts with amoebas, maybe, probably bacteria. Uh, uh, every everything is is organized and and cogn cognitive, uh, all the way down to the molecular level. Uh, as soon as it's uh, definable as life, cognition is there, uh, and uh, uh, lo looking at things. Uh, under a microscope or uh, following them uh, uh, sympathetically, uh, uh, few few biologists are are actually able to uh, feel empathy towards a, a situation, uh, uh, an organism. Uh, but uh, those who look with with empathy, with a, with a Carl Rogers attitude towards life. Mm -hmm. Uh, listening uh, rather than Im imposing uh, belief, uh, see that uh, cognition and learning uh, are uh, the, the basic reflex of life, uh, where, where there's uh, the ability uh, to uh, to uh, metabolize and move. Uh, there, there is understanding and 
adaptation. You wouldn't have life without adaptation. And there's always uh, uh, intelligence involved in adapting. Uh, every day you wake up, you're going to have to adapt to a whole new world. Uh, every, everything has changed while you were asleep. And uh, the, the process of, of breathing, uh, of your heart beating, uh, it all is cognitive. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, you have to listen to yourself while listening uh, to uh, things you're understanding. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, you will mistake what's happening in yourself uh, for what exists in the world. Uh, uh, schooling uh, consists largely in, in training people to uh, uh, get a, a little model of the world in themselves, which they can then uh, impose for the rest of their lives as they interact with the world. Uh, but uh, if you listen to the events in your own body, meaning that you're having uh, empathy uh, with what you're looking at, uh, then uh, you, you can see uh, how much of it is uh, your history, and then you you can see what is actually the history of the uh, the message or, or the behavior in front of you. Wow, that's powerful. I think uh, so. Is an example of, of I can think I think a lot of people think sometimes like rocks and pieces of plastic, for example, are inanimate, but even rocks and plastic are sensitive and can listen and can learn, right? Uh, 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 yeah, that little encyclopedia I, I mentioned before when I was uh, seven or eight, I started uh, looking at that because uh, uh, the school books weren't at all interesting. Uh, I, I found uh, J.C. Bowes described in the encyclopedia and uh, got interested in, in his experiments uh, and uh, uh, he, he called one of his devices a crescometer. Uh, he could uh, amplify uh, the growth of, of, uh, of seemingly uh, inert uh, of a vegetable or, or plant uh, 10,000 times or so, so that you could see it projected on the screen as it, as it grew. Uh, and <clears throat> then he would provide stimulus uh, of various sorts uh, and show uh, uh, that the plant was reacting uh, with, with a, a emotion in response. Uh, and he, he said that everything uh, shows emotion or, or a reaction to stimulation, uh, even minerals. Uh, and uh, the uh, at that time, physicist uh, Michael Polanyi, uh, who later became a, a philosopher, uh, but uh, w when he was working on uh, metal crystals uh, and uh, polymers, uh, he w was, he, I don't think he knew he was following in Bose's footsteps, but uh, Polanyi was demonstrating uh, that uh, Metal fatigue. Uh, Bose, Bose said that all substances uh, display the same properties that life does, just in a different form, uh, including learning and fatigue and so on. And uh, Polanyi uh, demonstrated that over and over uh, through the 1920s, uh, working with metal crystals uh, and uh, metallurgy. Uh, that uh, uh, the uh, mechanistic uh, idea of, uh, uh, of inert so-called material substance uh, was uh, uh, very far off uh, reality. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, it wasn't a matter of atom-to-atom uh, -atom organization, but uh, energy was spread out over a a wide area and the structure 
uh, went below the surface. Uh, that, that, that explains why uh, airplanes have to be finely polished if they're going to be supersonic because uh, the stresses uh, of a microscopic uh, scratch on the surface uh, will spread the influence uh, uh, over a great range. Polanyi demonstrated that, that uh, working uh, the surface of a crystal changed the whole uh, depth properties of, of resistance and uh, memory of the, of the crystal. Oh my gosh! Wow. So I mean, I, I just I, I wonder sometimes how more people don't don't hear of these things or learn these things. I mean, it seems like so so many of us and um, ravage the earth as if we came into it um, instead of instead of that we came out of it from it, um, mm -hmm. and and that we that it's organic just like us. It, is, it literally is us in some ways, um, and it's just it's just it's just you know, kind of crazy to me to think that so many people um, kind of blindly uh, steal from that which, you know, kind of gives us our life. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it was, uh, I, I think of it as kind of a, 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 a heresy against life that came to be known as, as mechanistic materialist science. The, the the official science philosophy uh, of the 20th century. Well, we we wanted you had a line once that that I really liked. You said the attempt to steer a person can make it hard for them to move because it, in, it inactivates their own guidance system. And I and I feel like the natural learn the natural learning process at work in in our in life, in all of life. Like the best thing we can do is just kind of get out of get out of the way. Um, do, do you agree with that? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The, 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 the person has, has everything needed uh, uh, except uh, the answer to each question as it comes up. I like that. My experience in recent years, Ray, because I, I do, I, you know, I've, been, I've been doing some kind of teaching, you know, um, uh, profession for for some years now too and and I, i'm seeing it seems more and more like like students are um just uh, they're, they're becoming better and better capable of like just regurgitating information but farther and farther from being able to look at unique situations in many different ways and i i like i like this idea that the, the really what we what we want to do is is create a situation where um we we are looking for real problems and then coming up with questions that really matter. So in your in your eyes, what are, what are the real problems? And what are and what are some questions that really matter? Uh, oh, uh, uh, understanding uh, what a cell is, what an organism is, uh, and what substance is, uh, and what mind is. Uh, uh, all of those. Uh, the, the biggest questions are, are still the most uh, needing uh, clear clear understanding. Uh, 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 what what causes sickness and aging? And so, at the root of at the root of these questions are a deeper exploration of life that will, that will move us move us into a different way of being. You think? Uh, 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 yeah. If if you uh, or, or if the, the present project of the, uh, the ruling class uh, goes ahead, uh, basically every, everyone is uh, a mechanical uh, a deadness, dead inside, because uh, they only have the role set for them by the, by the outside system. Uh, and uh, if we all start living fully and, and realizing that uh, the, the future is only uh, ours to be lived and created, uh, it, it has nothing should have nothing at all to do with the, the plans uh, made in uh, Davos 
uh, or uh, Washington or wherever. Yeah, yeah. Where did it? Where, wherever did that idea of competition come from as being meaningful in life? Or, or in other words, does does competition hurt or does it help in the learning process? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, oh, uh, the, the um, it, it helps in the mechanistic system in which you uh, the the theory of learning for a computer. Uh, uh, originally was that you, you punch holes in the card and uh, limit the uh, the possibilities by the holes you punch. Uh, when, when you get very full of holes, you have uh, defined its, its behavior most concretely. Mm -hmm. But uh, the actual way an organism works is that each time it achieves a new synthesis, it becomes a new question asker. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the whole situation changes every time you learn something. Uh, and so you're, you're a bigger and better question asker every time you, you assimilate uh, uh, the, the answer to a, a question or a problem. Uh, where the the training doctrine is that you become more and more uh, adept at following in, instructions. Mm -hmm. Is is opposition different than competition? That's a different thing entirely, right? Opposition is opposition good, and versus competition. Uh, uh, it depends on on what you're opposing. If you're opposing imposition. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's very constructive. What about collaboration? Where does that work in, into it? I mean, it sounds like collaboration would just be a part of everything uh, ev we're talking ev about. Everything is collaborative. What are What are some examples of uh, of okay. So, Red, Red, I'd love to just kind of go back, just kind of back a step in, in an individual's life, if you don't mind. I think this is really. I, I'm really loving this. Um, and if we were going to go to, like, a young person's life, say, three years old to 11 years old, what, what, what does an ideal, an ideal day of learning or of life look like for a 3- to 11-year-old in your eyes? Oh, um, the, the, uh, it's necessary to have uh, uh, organisms around uh, uh, the, the more organisms, the better, as long as they aren't dangerous, uh, and uh, that includes people, uh, and, and there should be people talking. Uh, uh, that that was one of uh, the things that uh, I, I thought was most important was, uh, uh, as a little kid, uh, watching adults uh, uh, talk and listening to them, uh, and. Uh, not having anything to say myself, but uh, just uh, listening to to what they were doing. Uh, and uh, uh, me meanwhile, uh, I would be uh, attending to uh, what, whatever might be the concern, uh, 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 a more private way. Uh, uh -huh. For for example, watching uh, how how the hairs on my uh, arm. Uh, made rainbows uh, as the light, as they turned in the light, uh, and I was starting to wonder uh, how, how light works, what light is, uh, and then uh, uh, how, how this, the eye perceives it, uh, and uh, the, the total openness, uh, uh, hearing, hearing what's going on uh, in the world, uh, not uh, either approving it or uh, disapproving it, especially just uh, uh, know, knowing that it's happening. Yeah. Uh, but then having uh, the undefined world uh, all around you, uh, watch, watching how flies wash their face, for example. That's really cool. Uh, so this is like science beginning to 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 be. Um, begin its life in you, right? Like uh, uh, yeah, yeah. My first uh, 
little experiments, I think I was about uh, a year old or so, uh, watching uh, when I cried uh, how, the, how the water in my eyes uh, affected the image. It affected the what? We said again? Uh, affected the image, uh, refracting, uh -huh. refracting the, the light, changing the color, and and distorting the image. Uh, wow. So, so what, what is Ray? What is science in a, in a fundamental level, away from the business of science? What, what can you like in a simple way? Can you sum up like what is, is what is science? Uh, it's open learning. Uh, the the idea that uh, learning uh, isn't uh, finished. You're always uh, uh, wanting to check it against reality, and reality is always changing, uh, and so it's always giving you opportunities for changing your mind. Uh, so truly, a never-ending process. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's where where science and education are the same thing, really. Oh, that's really cool. So aside from, I love how you talked about the, the commu a community of organisms and, and not necessarily people, right? But just all all of life um, uh, yeah, yeah. being important, and it, it it reminds me of the expression "it takes a village." So you're 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 taking that expression into a very pra I mean, very practically speaking, that it does take a village, right? Uh, oh yeah, uh, 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 flies and snails <laughs> and uh, plants and, and everything included. That's really cool. Uh, on, aside from aside from that, that village of, of, uh, of organisms, um, if you were going to make available a library or an atelier, a kind of workshop or, or learning space for a young learner, would there would you have anything in there? Or could you talk about what you might have in that workshop or like what kind of books you would put in there? I, I think uh, two or three uh, various kinds of encyclopedia would be good. Uh, it's uh, once once you learn uh, the alphabet, uh, it's really nice to uh, uh, get get an idea or a question uh, and uh, look out at the world and and uh, see what you think about it and and then see what you can find uh, other people have have thought about it. Uh, looking up ideas in the encyclopedia. Do you think there's anything online? I know with technology now we can do that so easily. Do you think there's anything that's trustworthy or any kind of way we can use online in a trustworthy way in that regard? Uh, not not really. Uh, you have to uh, – not trustworthy for sure. Uh, you, you have to know that intelligence organizations uh, devote a great amount of energy to Wikipedia, for example. Mm -hmm. What are some good uh, hard copy – um, encyclopedia or book? Could you recommend any? Oh, oh uh, after the uh, the old Funk and Wagnalls that we had at home, uh, I've always uh, used the Britannicas. I like to have uh, the 1910 uh, or 11 uh, edition, the 1930s and ah. 1950s editions, uh, because the the 1960-something edition was dumbed down. Okay. Do you think that uh, – do they still make the Encyclopedia Britannica? Do you know? I haven't, I, yeah, but I haven't looked at them since I, I saw how they uh, damaged the, the 1960s uh, new editions. Uh, but you, you can find the old ones at used bookstores very often. What, what are some other um, – sources of information you recommend or ways we can get, you know, instead of what's being, like, what's being taught, you, where can we go for, for information that's, that's more, you know, kind of what is versus what's being taught? Oh, uh, if you're near a, a good library, uh, uh, the, the libraries have pretty well been weeded out and censored, but you can still uh, often find things that the censors missed. So you would just, it's more about reading as much as you can and then learning to, to sift through it yourself, learning to trust your own guidance system and make 
critical decisions about what you're taking in? Uh, yeah. And it has to be a library where you can uh, actually go uh, look at the, uh, the shelves of books and not have to uh, write down what you want the librarian to bring you. Got it. Okay. Ray, Ray uh, what, what about nature? How, how, can, how can nature, being outside, what, what, why do you think that plays a, a, a vital role or does it play a vital role in, in someone's education? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, things, uh, uh, ordinary natural things as they occur, uh, you, you, even at the age of uh, three or four, uh, you're uh, generalizing and uh, making uh, uh, philosophical uh, inferences uh, from everything you see around you. Uh, so uh, it, it can be uh, dust and old leaves uh, as much as as uh, uh, nice running rivers and, uh, and mountains and such, but uh, uh, just watching what happens by itself, uh, it, it's so complex that you, uh, in, in perceiving it, you have to interpret it, and if, so, if you don't have someone telling you uh, how to uh, perceive it so you, it, you can make it useful, uh, uh, then your, your uh, uh, childish brain just naturally uh, tends to get a philosophical uh, uh, general uh, uh, approach to it. I, that's that's really cool, and I like how you said it doesn't matter where it is; it could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be, you know, some some river or in, in a grove of redwoods. It could literally just be out, you know, in your backyard, right? Uh, right, backyard nature. Um, Ray, Ray Thoreau, I guess, once wrote something on how um, he said the primal act of mobility connects us with our essential wildness and brings us to a spring of, of spiritual vitality that would otherwise be methodically dried up by our sedentary civilization. And I, I contrast this with, like, um, the classroom. Most, most classrooms are, are in four walls. Some of them don't even have windows. And you're, in, you're, you're just stuck in these desks, and you're, you're – you're, it's still, still today, right? it kind of um, really befuddles me that kids still today are, are asked to sit in a desk for 60 minutes and listen to someone lecture. Um, and I, I guess Aristotle, uh, allegedly, he had the habit of strolling while giving lectures. Um, so, so I guess my question is, do you think the opportunity that wandering or strolling or just getting out for a walk every day is, is, a, is, is a important? Uh, yeah, if you can't get up and walk around, Every time you feel like it, uh, you're a prisoner, uh, and it damages your, your brain as well as your body. Uh, 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 sitting uh, uh, for whatever, six hours a day in classrooms, uh, doing that for years, uh, it's horrible for the, the bodily health as well as the, the brain and its health. So it goes right right along with the uh, dogmatic um Forcing of ideas into, into young people's minds, uh, it, it, it collides uh, perfectly uh, with that. Sounds like um, I saw a stat recently. Speaking of that, the prison that you mentioned, 75% of UK students um, spend less time outdoors than prison inmates. <laughs> I can imagine that um, in the US, if that number is exceeded or, or at least matched. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the uh, that that whole uh, approach. It, it's. Uh, I, I think there's there's a lot of like like the superintendent of public instruction who said uh, education doesn't have anything to do with what students know. Uh, it, it's the obedience that is the essence of education, according to the understanding of the people who <laughs> control it. Yeah, and didn't Ivan Illich have a lot to say about that? I mean, um, he has an interesting quote. It's, it's um, related to medicine, but I think it's really all, all institutions. He says, modern medicine is a negation of health. It is not organized to serve human health, but only itself, which reminds me of, of education as an institution, and it makes more people sick than it heals. 
Um, so, Ray, do you think a, a more self-directed educational experience for, for more people could eventually flip the industry of medicine and medical culture on its head? I mean, and, and educational culture, same thing? I, I, I think that's a very important place to start is a totally uh, revising medical school. Uh, when I first taught endocrinology, I think it was at the uh, naturopathic school in Portland, uh, they were just trying to get going, uh, and they accepted uh, people who were interested in becoming naturopaths. Uh, and uh, one of my students uh, was a, a 30-something-year-old uh, taxi driver, uh, and she was, uh, you know how, how taxi drivers have to learn. Uh, she, she was from Seattle, and she had to have a living map of the city uh, alive in her uh, awareness. Yeah. And she could take that mentality and uh, understand the body and uh, the, the hormones and the nutrients in a way that a taxi driver is much better at than someone who has got A's from Yale, for example. Yeah. When I, when I went back to teach, uh, do single lectures, uh, about, uh, I guess, eight years later or so, uh, when the school was successful, they were admitting only uh, basically straight-A students from the best colleges. And those students were just about the most horrible uh, class I ever had. Uh, the, what they wanted was me to uh, give them a recipe. Uh, they they thought that medicine consisted uh, in, in learning recipes for for treating diseases. Wow. And that's just not how the organism works in various contexts, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's why medicine is killing people. Uh, yeah. the, the the official studies that show. Uh, medical accidents killing uh, something between 220,000 per year and 440,000 per year, uh, not counting hospital infections of about 100,000 per year. Uh, uh, just those numbers uh, rank uh, medical accidents uh, with uh, cancer and heart disease for number of people dying per year. But that's uh, accidents from a medical perspective, but if you assume that uh, a very large part of what they're doing, uh, for example, right now, uh, putting people uh, on ventilators, yeah. uh, uh, one hospital ventilating people was having a 60% mortality from the coronavirus, uh, a hospital nearby that stopped that conventional use of ventilators had a 0% mortality. Wow. So, so you can put down a very large portion of, of the coronavirus deaths to medical stupidity, not accidents. They're doing what they were taught to do properly uh, and is killing people. Uh, when you add that to the recognized medical accidents, uh, uh, medicine is uh, something like uh, genocide or World War. It's insane. Um, I, I recently was was hearing some commentary on the this uh, that like heart like stroke and, and heart disease patients have been like not coming in um, recently because they're afraid to go into an environment where right like all these people are going in for with the COVID symptoms, and um, that they think um, this commentary was saying they think a lot of people are dying at home alone because they're not getting the medical attention. But, I, but I'm wondering if the, the reverse of that is also true, that some people are not going in and actually it's saving their lives that they're not getting medical attention in some way. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. from that uh, observation in Germany of the two hospitals with different approaches, uh, uh, that was Luciano uh, Gadonini, I think, or Gadononi, uh -huh. uh, who... who uh, mentioned that uh, if that sort of thing is true, then you're saving your life by avoiding the hospital. <laughs> I, 
I wonder, you know, I, that, that, that idea that habits take a while to, to cement themselves, human behavior is hard to change. I wonder how many people will get through a time like this where, you know, this has been months now, it seems like, you know, where we've been told to stay at home and, you know, not do this and not do that. I wonder if some things as basic as, like, not wanting to go, you know, to the, to the hospital, like, a, do you think some of these, these ideas um, will last in people? Or do you think people w- will just go right back to, to their ways as before? I think that would be nice to hope for, that people realize they can get by without doing their stupid job. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I wonder if some people are, are actually realizing that that that, that, you, that they can make ends meet, and and uh, and I don't know. It, it seems like a lot of people have been so brainwashed, and uh, and also rely on that that, that check. That working, you know, that job or whatever. So I, I, I wonder about that. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, a, a very big part of of the work done in the U.S. currently is just basically to uh, make the person stay in the office 40 hours a week uh, uh, full time. When when I did nutrition counseling uh, for a while, 40, 40, 50 years ago, uh, I found that. That was what the the employer had in mind. Uh, even when there was no work to be done, uh, you were supposed to be there uh, from uh, nine to five or whatever. And it, it it stops people from thinking about what they're really interested in. And then when they go home, they're we're so tired that we just turn on the uh, the old TV or you know just, <laughs> just it, it just eliminates the time for thinking. It kind of reminds me of a Noam, Noam Chomsky. Lion, I think he said once that, that, like, similarly, students who go to college and they pay these massive debts, they put themselves through school and they're unlikely to think about changing society because when, you, when, they, when they get trapped in these systems of debt, they can't afford any more of the time to think. Ray, um, I, I, had a, I had a question that was that's related to this, uh, this, this kind of more, like, Murray, Murray Bookchin, have you... Have you um, read oh, oh, his book? Oh, yeah, I read several of his uh, pamphlets and, and little uh, things in the, the 70s, I guess it was. Okay, and does he, he kind of talks about a more decentralized, almost anarchist society similar to, like, uh, Ivan Illich, correct? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, that kind of decentralization, I, I think, is the only way uh, a, a large population can make a society work uh, without uh, destroying uh, people's health and and mentality. Uh, uh, A consumer co-op, for for example, uh, should uh, uh, be an organizing principle. Uh, If consumers uh, demand uh, that uh, products change, uh, that that can be a, a big pressure and then uh, the, the people uh, c- can uh, have various kinds of, of cooperative ways of, of meeting those consumer demands. Interesting. So, so um, uh, I haven't read a lot, a lot of his stuff, but I want to read more more of it. Sounds really interesting. Um, a friend of mine posed the question, and I thought it was a really good question. And, and you might have kind of answered it a little bit in, in what you just said. But his his question was that because a lot of our scientific development, it seems to him right now, this fundamental science that we're we're learning about seems very equipment intensive. Um, It seems that only large organizations with a lot of funding can actually do these experiments. Um, And I think I think you even actually mentioned in one of your articles once um, about in the 1960s there was a government lab with an equipment that no one else had, and therefore they they couldn't be replicated. Uh, yeah, it's a, a great opportunity for fraud. Yeah, so so I guess my my the, my friend's question was that in a decentralized society, without large organizations and like basically huge huge funding um, you know sources, um, it, it will will equipment related science kind of go away, or or, or is it going to be like what you said that those demands are going to be met by the the, the cooperative interests? Uh, one of the reasons I, I went to graduate school uh, for a PhD in biology was uh, that I had many experiments in mind that required 
uh, equipment of various sorts. Okay. Uh, and so when I got there, uh, I, I would just uh, wander around the building, uh, peeking in labs and seeing what people were doing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, at that time, uh, people weren't so secretive <laughs> and uh, uh, protective of, of what they were doing. And uh, I, I got to use uh, all kinds of, of different lab equipment uh, just as a visitor. Interesting. So, so, but now, now, do you think that the same opportunities would would be able to be had by people? Uh, 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 no, I've I've heard uh, uh, people express attitudes that, uh, that it, uh, you, you have to be qualified to have access to certain instruments. Uh, uh, did you read the book Seeing Red? Uh, no, I have not. Uh, an astronomer. Uh, uh, he, had, he was one who uh, ob observed uh, galaxies uh, that were uh, receding at, at uh, approaching the speed of light, uh, connected with a string of matter to a galaxy that wasn't receding at the speed of light. Uh, oh. uh, 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 he, he collected pictures of, of a lot of those and uh, people started realizing that was a, a, a challenge to the basic dogma about the red shift representing expansion of the universe. And, and if you see uh, galaxies that are connected uh, with a continuous stream of matter, but with different red shifts, uh, that, that makes uh, impossible to explain the redshift in the conventional way. So what they did was not let them use the big telescopes anymore. Oh, my gosh. So, so I mean, yeah, that, I guess that's kind of like part of this, my friend's question, and I'm, and I'm wondering, like, if, if, if we get to a more decentralized situation ever, and if people, um, you know, a small number of pe very curious people end up, you know, going towards that, they're very scientifically inquisitive. They want to do, you know, science, and they and they if they develop their little playground of science. Um, is it going to kind of almost recreate this small clique of, of scientific elite where you kind of have to be one of those people to, to study it? Or, or as soon as you um, take away the control of the corporations who are uh, keeping basically a, a, a culture of secrecy. Uh -huh. you, you can't have classified research done at universities, for example, but uh, 20 years ago that was uh, the basically selling the universities to the corporations for funding uh, and having uh, a lot of the research tied in to the military and corporation uh -huh. uh, private uh, property idea of knowledge. Uh, that whole concept of knowledge is incompatible with knowledge. <laughs> And uh, yeah. uh, so uh, I think changing the, the ownership of the instruments, uh, making them public like they used to be uh, still uh, in 1970. So, so you're saying if the uh, overall values of the, of the um, decentralized community are the, that of collaboration and togetherness, that that, 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 that that probably won't happen is what you're saying? Uh, yeah. Interesting. What do you think about education? Do you think in, in general, do you think people will all, because uh, natural learning will be allowed to express itself, do you think everyone will be well-educated? I mean, I don't even know what well-educated means in a general you know, way, but do you, do you think that education will rise in a decentralized uh, environment? I, you know, the uh, no child left behind thing where they created standardized exams, Yep, yeah, that's great. Uh, 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 the Blake College uh, accepted the pre-existing graduate record exams uh, and uh, uh, didn't uh, offer uh, any organized uh, uh, survey of, of knowledge, but just by uh, being themselves, uh, they, for, for some reason, uh, were, were able to, in a very short length of time, master the conventionally accepted knowledge. Uh, and 
I, I think if you ask why they're in school, what are they supposed to be doing, and you say, well, they have to know these things, uh, then uh, say uh, uh, when you're uh, uh, ready to go uh, to medical school, for example, uh, here's the test that you have to take. Uh, and uh, for whatever you you do, uh, uh, dri driving a taxi and, and yeah. reading the encyclopedia or whatever, yeah, yeah, uh, that's adequate preparation. So you can save uh, thousands of hours of sitting in in classrooms. Uh, the the yeah. uni University of Chicago under uh, uh, Robert Hutch Hutchins. Uh -huh. uh, for 1929, for 10 or 12 years, uh, that, that was their policy. Uh, uh, some people uh, could get their bachelor's degree uh, in uh, half a year or so. I mean, it makes so much sense in terms of the humanitarian humanity side of it and the personal, you know, being being a, a happy person and, a, and a, living a satisfied satisfactory life, like it makes so much sense, and not not creating this apathetic kind of situation for years and years and years, you know, just so that people can become you know a worker bee in the in the system. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and not only for uh, gaining entrance to to medical school or law school or, or whatever uh, graduate school. Uh, if you uh, say a doctor or a lawyer uh, can't practice unless they know certain things, uh, well, there must be an exam for uh, telling whether someone knows those things or not. Uh, so uh, don't require medical school even or law school. If yeah. a person has uh, their own way of learning those things, uh, let them practice. So in a decentralized state, these institutions and these professions will look totally different, yeah? Uh, yeah. Uh, Milton Friedman himself, the, the Chicago, Chicago School conservative e economist, uh, uh, he uh, described uh, licensing uh, as uh, something uh, destroying civilization. Wow. Did, did, Ray, did the... Um 20th century, like Soviet bloc countries, did they um, experiment with some of these things? In the, uh, and and you know what? Can we learn anything from from that? Uh, uh, yeah, for a time in the the 20s, uh, there was tremendous experimentation, and then uh, as soon as Hitler uh, came to power with his uh, project for uh, dealing uh, with the Slavs. Uh, uh, starting right in 1933, uh, experiment uh, ended, uh, and they uh, got engaged in the business of of uh, uh, not being taken over by Hitler. Jeez. Um, so, so do you think there's other things too? That, I mean, are there other examples of things we can learn from from what they were doing? Oh. oh uh, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of good science uh, w was really developing in in those early years uh, w between the wars. Uh, psychology, philosophy, education ideas, uh, learn learning ideas, uh, therapeutic ideas. Did you write about some of that stuff in your book on mind and tissue? Is that is that? Uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. How how can someone get? Uh, a book like that, or any any of the books you, that you've written, I, I still, still have a lot of copies of that uh, printed on paper uh, at, at uh, Ray Pete's newsletter uh, at gmail dot com. Okay, so someone could just uh, email you at Ray Pete's newsletter at gmail dot com, and they can ask those kinds of questions: how to sign up to your newsletter, or how to get copies of, of some of the books that you've written. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, do, are, are you familiar with uh, Charlotte I Iserbite, I think is her name? Have you ever heard of her? I don't recognize her. 
Okay, I guess she 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 did some uh, critique on the foundational works of modern education, but I just kind of wanted to say this and and it just it just it it really just kind of piggybacks some of the stuff that you said, and and I wanted to kind of hear if you had any more thoughts to it. But she said that um, that that they were very open. If you if you look at the foundational works of modern education, they were very open in their design end goal of worldwide scientific socialism where all decisions are, in fact, to be made by the experts and, and not by the citizens. So a thinking, questioning citizen may be desirable for a republic, um, but it is very dangerous to a scientific uh, dictatorship. And I think, uh, it's, it's, you know, that scientific dictatorship is the opposite of what you think would be good, according to, like, Illich's stuff and, and Bookchin's idea of decentralization, right? I, I, I think it's an ideology that uh, is uh, being – Starting about 1950, uh, there were uh, people subsidized by the CIA uh, basically uh, laying out the blueprint for uh, exactly that. Ray, this has been amazing. A um, couple, couple of things before we close. I'm just so grateful for your time. I think a lot of people are really going to love this. This is really a treat for me, too. Um, you know, there's still going to be people, I think, that are, that are bad-mouthing, you know, homeschooling because it's something different, or not even homeschooling, but just, just doing something different as far as education. And, and so some of the common arguments I've heard are kids will miss out on routine, discipline, socialization. These are all things you've already touched on. But do you have anything else to add to, to that when someone uh, critiques? an experimental um, education idea? Well, uh, the state is making itself involved even in home education. To I know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. They, they like, they like uh, in some ways, determine what curriculum they think needs to be covered. Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, that should be totally held off for some kind of a, a big exam day uh, 15 years later. Yeah. So, so what can we do? I mean, is there legally speaking, is there any way to do um, an education that's actually free? I mean, um, they're, they're, in some states, I know they'll they'll put parents in jail if if their kids don't go to school. Uh, yeah, yeah. Same thing. Uh, if you don't uh, take your kids to the doctor for vaccination, they can put you in jail for child abuse. Just amazing. What, so, what can we do? Resist. Yeah. <laughs> until, until they take us away, right? It, yeah, invent new ways of, of resisting and and uh, enlightening the oppressors. Yeah, play, play, play the game in submersive ways, right? Yeah. Subversive, subversive ways. Uh, yeah, yeah, some of the oppressors are, are, are open to, to change and learning. Well, that's hopeful. Um, Ray, Ray, I'd like to close. Uh, there's a there's an Einstein quote, and and I've seen it on the internet attached to an image, and I just want to like kind of say, you know throw this out there, and I'll put it up maybe on the uh, on the thing when I post this on YouTube, um, so viewers can see it. I'm sure other people have seen it, but the Einstein quote is that everybody is a genius. Um, that that if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. And and um, it reminds me of that story you told me earlier about the, the kid who came into your 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 college who who by all the testing standards um, showed uh, that it was he was basically dumb and um, when given the chance to to kind of you know craft an education and a way of thinking that was his own he revealed that he was nothing of the sort mm -hmm. and um, so this image is like all the animals lined up and they have like a, a bird and a monkey and a elephant and a fish and a seal and a dog and they're all lined up in front of a, a, a table and there's a judge behind the table and the judge says for a fair selection everybody has to take the same exam please climb that tree over there <laughs> and I, I think that i don't know to me that just epitomizes this this strange and backwards world we live in and and um some of the opportunity we have to oppose that uh, uh, yeah, if you want to do something else, there should be a different exam for it. Exactly. Well, I, I guess cheers to uh, to continuing to try to come up with ways to, uh, to, to, to craft a meaningful existence, right? Yep.
Awesome. Well, uh, Ray, thank you so much for your time. And to the other um, the other person in the house, I know I, I, I'm sure it's uh, you know a lot a lot to to let you you know do these interviews and stuff. So I appreciate her you know uh, giving you the time to do this. And, and uh, thanks for letting us get into your life for a little bit. It's really awesome. Okay. Thank you. You're you're welcome. It's my pleasure.